On a fine sunny day in Latvia, welcome to the seventh event of the Nordic Baltic Business Forum series and the second event this year focusing specifically on the EU Green Deal and Nordic Baltic Partnership. Today's overarching theme will be building sustainable trade and logistics networks between the Nordic and Baltic countries with an excellent lineup of speakers, both from the public and private sector. My name is Baiba Rubesa, and I will be your moderator. The event is organized by the Norwegian, Swedish, and Finnish Chambers of Commerce in close partnership with the Nordic Council of Ministers Office in Latvia and with the support of the Norwegian, Swedish, and Finnish embassies in Latvia. Today's event also takes place in liaison with Nordic Days, now in Ventspils. So before we get to the core program, I would like to invite the director of the Nordic Council in Latvia, Stefan Eriksson, for the official opening remarks. Thank you, Baiba. Uh, I will just say some short introductory words to open this very important event. Uh, I'm here in Ventspils together with my Nordic colleagues, the Nordic ambassadors, for the Nordic Days. This is an event that we every year uh, arrange in the Latvian, uh, in Latvia's regions. Uh, this time the turn has come to, to Ventspils. Uh, and a very, thanks to a very timely initiative by the Nordic Chambers of Commerce uh, uh, and other partners, we uh, uh, are doing this event. Uh, well, due to the circumstances that are uh, a bit special as we are all are aware of, uh, we cannot do it fully as was planned originally, uh, but uh, I'm glad to say that I'm here together with my Danish and Norwegian colleague, uh, colleagues uh, at the Ventspils High Technology, Technology Park, uh, learning more about their, uh, uh, their work. Uh, and uh, uh, the theme of this, uh, this small uh, uh, conference or seminar, what we choose to call it, is uh, how to, to build sustainable trade uh, uh, and logistic networks in the Nordic Baltic region, something that I, I think is of, of high importance really for all of us. So we're very glad that we, we can do this event in a bit different way than was planned. So uh, uh, regards from us here in, in Ventspils, uh, and I wish you all uh, an interesting and uh, fruitful afternoon today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Now, trade and shipping are actually ancient areas of uh, human interaction. But today, though, they seem to be in the middle of their own paradigm shift. Due to the demands of climate change and changes in trade routes, expectations by customers, companies, and governments as to what trade and logistics networks deliver is changing. The demand for sustainable solutions for our lives is changing also the role of ports, thus shipping and logistics. When was the last time any of you woke up to read the news that the President of the United States of America has met with the heads of American ports to not only discuss improvements in the supply chain, but sustainable port management too? I don't know about you, but I did this morning. Now, our program is very dense. So before we commence, here are some housekeeping rules and information. As our goal is to explore opportunities for creating new and sustainable trade networks, partnerships and solutions that would help us recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and help us achieve the ambitious climate goals, today's program is organized essentially into three parts. The first one, gaining the big picture from the European Commission and the Nordic perspective. Secondly, learning what Latvia's action plan towards the implementation of climate neutrality goals and the role of ports and the logistics sector in achieving them are. And thirdly, exploring what the outlook of shipping companies and energy producers is towards their role in decarbonizing trade. Now, if you would like to raise any questions, please don't hesitate and proceed to www.slide.do 
enter the code in Slido of hashtag one, and then five times the four, so one, four, 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 which you see on the screen, and post your question. In today's event, I will bring you questions to the attention of our speakers. So the first speaker. Martin Zemitis is the European Commission's stalwart representative in Riga, the right fellow to il illuminate all of us about the impact of the European Green Deal and blue economy and what it would have on mobility, transport, logistics, and ports. Martin, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much, Baiba, and it is a privilege and an honor uh, to be addressing uh, such a great uh, network of Nordic uh, Baltic uh, experts, business, the public sector. Uh, I would have very much liked to address you in person. You know that more than anyone, I love uh, live performances and live interactions, but uh, let it be, let's hope that uh, rather sooner than later, uh, we're able to go back to uh, some sort of normalcy and, and, and engage in person. And while I load up my uh, presentation, uh, let me express uh, how thankful I am for the opportunity uh, to be talking on the European Green Deal and the blue economy. We all need to put more uh, green into blue, uh, regardless of whether it's in the private sector or the public sector. The European Green Deal is something that derives from um, our global ambition uh, to be climate, climate neutral. We all recall or most of us would recall the Paris Agreement, which was signed uh, in 2015, which was a global ambition to move towards climate neutrality. And we all have only one planet, but there has been no uh, industrial society, uh, at least in the, in the West, which has reached its level of development by not exceeding the planet's ecological boundaries. We are in fact living as if we had three planets, but we only have one, and hence uh, the the countries of the globe have joined hands you know, and established uh, both the global sustainable uh, development goals and the Paris Agreement. And now in the up and, and running up to COP 2026, the, the, another round of, of global climate negotiations, uh, it is the right time to take stock of, of where we are. But European continent is the continent which aspires to be climate neutral by 2050. And this is not just an aspiration. This is in fact a, a climate law this has been enshrined and agreed by the heads and state of government. That is to say that uh, by 2050, the European continent wants to be a net, uh, net zero uh, or, or climate neutral. We will not eliminate all the emissions, of course, by 2050, but we will be able to develop carbon sinks, such as forests, and also, I'm sure, carbon capture and storage technologies. Regardless of this, we have a lot of work to do to de decarbonize the various industries. Uh, the homes, uh, the cars, the, the mobility, uh, there's a lot of work uh, out there. Uh, but the good news is that the European countries collectively have been able to reduce emissions by 20% from a baseline of 1990 while growing at uh, the economy at more than 60%. So we have done this uh, momentous task of reducing emissions while growing in the past. And the ambition is that we can uh, continue this trend. But of course, that will require a lot of concerted effort. From, from all industries taken together, and notably also uh, the trade uh, and, and maritime industry. The European Green Deal is not just an ambition. It is, in fact, Europe's new growth strategy. Europe aims to change the growth model and put sustainable, uh, not as a separate climate on environmental policy, but sus put sustainable uh, sustainability or, or decarbonization at the root of every policy that, that we do. But of course, in parallel, we need to develop the blue economy, which is all that economy that is around the seas and oceans, you know, writ large, you know, both the ship building and maritime activities, coastal tourism, and also new emerging sectors. So we need to develop the green and, and, and the blue in parallel. Now, what is the European Green Deal? A little bit in more detail. It is, of course, increasing EU's climate ambition for 2030 and, uh, and, and 20, uh, uh, 20, uh, 2050. Uh, it is supplying clean, affordable, and secure energy. So both in terms of energy production, uh, but also in terms of energy consumption and the way we, uh, the way we deal with energy throughout the, throughout the value chains. It is about mobilizing industry for a clean and circular economy. It is building and renovating in a way that is resource efficient. Uh, it is also the, the zero pollution ambition that European continent aspires to be zero pollution 
uh, by 2050 by the same, uh, the same uh, deadline. And of course, this is also about preserving and restoring ecosystems, about greening the common agricultural policy and common fisheries policy. And it is also, of course, accelerating the shift to sustainable and smart mobility of which uh, the green economy is very much a part of. Of course, this will not come cheap. This will require investment from both the public and largely also from the private sector, to which I will come towards the end of my presentation. But our ambition is also low, uh, leave no one behind, so that this change of the economic model, this transition is not unfair, that it does not leave uh, any region or any industry behind. Of course, there will be winners and losers. Of course, companies will have to change their business models and there will be regions which will suffer more than others, which are more dependent on fossil fuels. But our ambition is not to uh, lessen the quality of life. It is to create new opportunities, new chances uh, for, for both uh, the industry and others. So Fit for 55, this is uh, the package which was uh, presented by the commission in the July of this year. And this piece of the puzzle is a, a set of interlocking uh, legal, re legal regulations and, and directives uh, aiming to create the, 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 the base, the legal base uh, for, for, the, for the green transition in the European continent. And this is a number of different uh, legal provisions uh, relating from areas such as uh, forests uh, to energy efficiency, uh, not only in buildings, but in transport and in industry. It is new provisions for extending the emissions trading, the European cap and trade system. It is a new carbon border adjustment, uh, adjustment mechanism so as to prevent carbon leakage. There's also a provision for the Climate Social Fund. As we all know that energy prices are, are rising rapidly and there are some pundits which are arguing that this is in fact, even before the European Green Deal is put into effect, this is uh, deriving from European, uh, European Green Deal. And in fact, there is uh, a provision in place to, uh, to help the vulnerable. Uh, so there is a lot of pieces of the puzzle which must come together. And let's now focus and zero in a little bit on the transport uh, sector. Now, transport is, is an emitting sector. It emits about one uh, third of European emissions. Uh, and if you look at the transport portfolio, of course, road transport, be it uh, private cars or, or vans uh, or, uh, or, 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 um, or heavy, heavy duty vehicles, which, is, which account for more than 70% of the emissions. Aviation accounts for about uh, one eighth, it's about 14% but also waterborne transport. Even though it's not the biggest emitter, it does uh, contribute its fair share of emissions to the portfolio. Railways is a nice one, especially electrified railways. And that's also where the modal shift is, is, is happening. And Europe is building, of course, more railways to, to, to energize this modal shift. So this is, this is the, the, the transport emissions portfolio. Now, um, moving on to uh, uh, a little bit zeroing in on the, on the sectors. Of course, transport is a big sector. And there is road transport, which accounts for about one fifth of the emissions. Then we have aviation, about 3.8% of the total emissions, not just of the transport emissions. And then you have the maritime sectors, which account for about 4% of the emissions. And therefore, and unfortunately, in the transport sector, unless, unlike in some other sectors, where we have been able to reverse the trend, where the emissions are in fact being reduced, in the maritime sector and the transport sector in general, unfortunately, in the last uh, uh, 10 years uh, in the European continent, we have not been able uh, to reduce the emissions, uh, except for the COVID effect, but which is, of course, uh, expected to be short-lived. There was a short dip uh, in the, during the COVID times because of the uh, decreasing economic activity, uh, but, but, but that, that's, that's, of course, is, is a short solace. So the European Commission is proposing a number of important things which will affect the maritime industry in quite profound and significant ways. And one is the extension of the emissions trading system to the maritime sector, starting with 2023, uh, with a, with a phase-in period, not, not immediately. Uh, and the focus, of course, would be sort of on the large emitters, on the large container uh, and passenger ships above the 5,000 uh, gross tonnage, which in fact account for more than 90% of the CO2 emissions in the maritime sector. So the focus is not on the sort of the, the small, uh, fishing vessels you know, by, the, by the coast, but on the sort of the big, big emitters which produce a lot of emissions, which consume a lot of, lot of energy. And this will not um, affect uh, absolutely everyone. It will affect all the intra, inter-EU traffic, but 50% of the extra EU traffic. Uh, really voyages sorry. Covered. I'm really sorry. Yes. You have one more minute to go. One more minute to go. Um, then we- Give you um, two, but really two. Okay, beautiful. 
The other thing which the EU is proposing is the fuel EU maritime directive. And that is also a game changer. It is a way to decarbonize ships. And of course, um, we're climate neutral and, and we try to be climate neutral and we also try to be technology neutral. So the commission is not prescribing any one type of, of energy, which would be the aim. Uh, rather, the commission is proposing uh, targets and, and limits uh, to uh, greenhouse gas intensity. So uh, the regulation proposes uh, the, to reduce the greenhouse gas intensity of the energy used on board the ships by 2% by 2025, and ultimately in iterations by 75% by 2050. So extending the ETS and decarbonizing uh, the ships. Another thing which I must mention before I finish is that also there will be an obligation for the most polluting ships to connect to onshore power supply or use zero emission technologies at birth when they are standing at port. Uh, of course, for if they're standing for longer than two hours with a few other limitations, but these are three quite uh, important changes in the, in the, in, in the works, in, the, in progress, in the making, which will, of course, quite profoundly affect the shipping industry. And, and most operators and ports will have to take this into, into mind. And of course, the idea is to put a price on carbon, to price carbon what it, what it costs and put the maritime sector into the carbon pricing system. This is here where I stop. We have big changes coming. Uh, we have legislative changes. Of course, this will require a lot of investment, a lot of cooperation between the private and the public sectors. But the European Commission is there to help with regulation, uh, with advice, and also with uh, quite a bit of funding. With this, I stop and uh, hand it over to Baiba. Martin, thank you very much for now. Take a short break. I'm very sorry to try to cut you off, but I'm sure you're not going to be the only one. Uh, let me now, first of all, bring in a Nordic view, and then let's have a slight discussion with all three of you together once we have the next intervention. You know, globally, it's no secret that the Nordic countries are seen as most progressive, diligent, and able to execute climate footprint reduction exercises, as I would call them. I would urge you to listen to what the leaders of the renowned Nordic Energy Research will share with us on Nordic clean energy scenarios. They have a lot to say, but unfortunately today there's a limit of 10 minutes again. Though you can submit questions to both gentlemen on Slido. Remember, it's Slido and then hashtag one and five times the four. Klaus Skutte, Kevin Jonsen, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, I will begin. My name is uh, Klaus Skutte, and I'm the CEO of Nordic Energy Research. Like uh, Matthias, I was, I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there with, together with you and, and, uh, and Stefan in, in Vetvic, but, but I hope to do that uh, next time. Next slide, please. So Nordic Energy Research is a Nordic institution under the auspice of the Nordic Council of Ministers. We finance energy research and facilitate energy cooperation between the Nordic countries, uh, Iceland, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, the Faroe Islands, Greenland, and all that, as well as between the Nordic countries and our neighboring countries in the Arctic and the Baltic countries. Next slide, please. So the Baltic Nordic countries have a unique and a long-standing cooperation on energy. We at Nordic Energy Research, we have facilitated governmental network and working groups, uh, as well as scenario. And we have yeah, also even our Baltic Nordic Energy Research uh, program together, where we have local partners from Latvia, as well as the other uh, Baltic countries. As you see, just within the, the last three years, we have uh, had a couple of, of uh, research projects. We have new one going on, so it's a continual program. We have an analysis between the, the cooperation between uh, the Nordic and the Baltics, as well as we have a, a um, mobility program uh, between the countries uh, in the Nordic uh, Baltic region. <clears throat> I can also mention that within the Nordic Energy Research Program, we have a program research program on maritime transport and energy research. And there we see that the future balance between dielectrification as well as power to X and hydrogen to electrofuels like ammonia for, for, for shipping and other subjects are really 
hot subjects right now that can affect the entire energy uh, demand as well as, as on, on the cooperation. Uh, and also to put it in a larger perspective, when you have the, the Nordic Prime Minister's joint declaration on carbon neutrality in 2019, and with the common vision of the Nordic region to become the most integrated and sustainable region in the world, it's obvious to look for common solution. Therefore, I believe it's, it's time to further the, the Nordic Baltic uh, energy cooperation with the green transition as new framework. But therefore, greatly appreciate this seminar on sustainable trade and logistic networks between the Nordic and the Baltic. And I'm very pleased that we have the opportunity to present some of our scenarios. With these words, I thank you, and I'll let the word pass on to my colleague, Kevin. So uh, thank you, Klaus, and uh, greetings from Oslo. Uh, my name is Kevin Johnson. I work as a senior advisor at Nordic Energy Research and has been doing so for the uh, last five years. I've also had the pleasure to lead our effort on the Nordic Clean Energy Scenarios project that you will get a brief introduction to today. Uh, so uh, yeah, stay with me. So first of all, as uh, mentioned, uh, we have been working with this type of analysis for the last uh, 10 years, with the first analysis being done in cooperation with the IEA in 2013. Uh, then we did a follow-up in 2016, but as uh, most of you who follow the, the energy space probably knows, it's, there has happened quite a lot since 2016. So we wanted to do a new analysis and get some new results in the Nordic region. And that's why we decided to, to commit to the, uh, or commission a new Nordic clean energy scenarios, also to look into the, uh, how to uh, achieve the, the goals of the Nordic prime ministers. I would also like to say that I've been, I've been uh, had the pleasure to lead another project where we worked together with the Baltic countries, the Baltic energy technology scenarios, where we looked more in detail into the Baltic energy system and how the Baltic countries uh, could achieve uh, the EU 2030 targets, but also looking forward towards uh, 2050. And this was an, al an analysis that we did in cooperation with the Baltic ministries as well. So moving on to the Nordic Clean Energy Scenarios project. So first of all, we had a large consortium of uh, well-educated researchers and consultants, over 30, uh, working together with us on this, being led by Anna Fost, but also the Energy Modeling Lab. We're very happy to have had their, their input and their efforts into this project. So what we did in this project was that we uh, decided to develop three storylines. We developed a carbon neutral Nordic scenario uh, that translates into a least cost pathway for achieving the Nordic uh, countries and national targets. But we also wanted to look into uh, some different storylines that could emerge as well. So we developed a Nordic powerhouse scenario where the Nordic countries take a more active role in the overall European energy transition, uh, supplying more electricity and more power to X fuels and also working as a, um, a <coughs> carbon capture and storage hub for, for Northern Europe. And then again, a clean, uh, a carbon neutral behavior scenario where we wanted to look into how the um, behavioral aspects of the Nordic population could play into the energy transition. So in this scenario, we'll look into how, for instance, the effect of uh, uh, the air passenger traffic uh, not bouncing up above the 2019 level uh, will influence the, the energy system. And based on these three storylines, we found that uh, most solutions could be uh, um, gathered into what we call five solution tracks towards carbon neutrality. Kevin, so what you first you see here is uh, the, fossil, Sorry. the fossil fuels. It's the um, uh, kind of the suspect that we would like to get rid of. And in general, for the three different scenarios, we find that the most efficient way to reduce emissions is direct el electrification. So for instance, going from an internal combustion engine to an EV or direct electrification of industrial processes. But we of course also recognize that there are areas where this is, uh, is not as easy. So we also look into three other technology, technologies that could, could help us in the transition, namely power to X, bioenergy and also carbon capture and storage uh, that also plays into this. On top of this, of course, as mentioned, we have behavioral change that could help ease the transition. 
So it's not a substitute for the other technological changes, but it could ease the transition if, if the behavior goes in the right way. But here's also a warning that the behavior could also help making the transition harder if the population uh, make uh, changes in their energy consumption so that the energy consumption goes up as well. And based on, on these results, we, we landed on four target areas for Nordic collaboration where we in the report saw that Nordic collaboration could benefit the transition. So first of all, we saw that there could be a benefit from coordinating and, uh, and, and, and collaborate on the Nordic power infrastructure. We thought saw that there was a big uh, possibility to cooperate on uh, integrated offshore wind and, green develop and grid development. Uh, we found that a common vision for the role of Power2x would be very beneficial, having in mind that the amount of Power2x produced greatly influences the need for electricity production. And then lastly, we also find that there would be a lot of uh, benefits from uh, cooperating together on a Nordic uh, carbon capture and storage strategy. So what I've <coughs> tried to kind of find based on my earlier work in the Baltics, but also on this Nordic project and up for discussion later today is, is possible areas for Baltic Nordic collaboration. So could there, for instance, be a benefit from working together on offshore wind energy hubs? Could there be a, an, a benefit on, on working together on common carbon capture and storage infrastructure in the Baltics, uh, working on power infrastructure planning, and also on how to sustainably produce biofuels in the future. These are some of the topics that I would like to raise. And then uh, since we are short in time, I would say that this is just a brief uh, presentation of a vast amount of results that we have. So please go to our website, nordicenergy.org, if you would like to read more. Here you can also order the report physically and, and read it digitally. Uh, and also just mentioning that there's a lot of other supplementary material like uh, open access models, uh, technology catalog, and uh, statistics database there that you can look into if you're really interested. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you for the attention. Kevin and uh, Klaus, thank you very much for the very swift intervention. To those watching, I can certainly tell you it is very worthwhile having, uh, having a look at the material. I had the privilege of perusing it in advance. But I would have a question to Kevin. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that the four areas of co collaboration that you outlined for the Nordics and then in your own way transpose back to what the levels of cooperation could be for the uh, between actually the Baltic and the Nordics, is the, are there any tangible results or collaboration already in in any of the areas that you have mentioned? So I know that there's a cooperation between the Nordic and the Baltic TSOs looking into uh, offshore grids and also uh, offshore wind development. Uh, on what level this is, I'm I'm not that sure, but I I know they're talking together um, as. Uh, <coughs> As Klaus mentioned, we also have the Nordic uh, or the NGCCUS group where there's also participation from the Baltic governments as well. So they're at least following the discussion we're having in the Nordics. Uh, so uh, I think we're getting there, but it could also be, of course, it could also be always be increased as well. Great movement. Thank you very much. And let me just ask one question to Martin, who I hope is still online with the EU. Uh, I was struck by the slide that highlighted financing the transition while leaving nobody behind. Do you actually think this is impossible, one of the most unequal countries in the European Union? This uh, is a challenge, and it will be a challenge. Um, energy transitions are, are never easy. I mean, you can draw scenarios, uh, but uh, at any scenario of any transition, any type of reform, there are always winners and losers. Mm. But the ambition is so that we get social acceptance for this, so that we don't uh, lose people along the way, is to, is to design the transition in, in, in a way that we keep uh, the issue of, of social equality in mind. And there's different ways how to go about it. I mean, this week alone, the European Commission published a, a toolbox, mm. what the governments can do, uh, for instance, in support of the vulnerable uh, households, um, even in this hopefully short-lived uh, energy crisis that we're living through. But also we have to uh, recognize that uh, we have to price carbon and the price of carbon will drive up the price of the fossil fuels. And the more dependent we'll be as economies on fossil fuels, the more vulnerable we'll be. 
So that's why, you know, this energy transition, hopefully in, in cooperation with, uh, with the Nordic countries, as, as, as we are already in energy sector and, you know, we're part of the same uh, stock exchange, uh, North, yeah. North Pole uh, spot, hopefully there will be more, more of that and, uh, and that these costs can be sort of distributed in more, uh, in more ways. But to Baiba, uh, this will be, of course, a challenge, as you rightly point out. So, question to you. If there were only one action that needs to be taken in Latvia to really um, uh, sort of power start the EU Green Deal, what should Latvia do? What's that first step? This is not something that the Commission has not been uh, trying to um, underline and stress for for a while. Uh, I think if we look uh, critically uh, at the energy generation sectors of the three Baltics, but also in relation to the Baltics and Nordics, we see Latvia lagging behind in one very important source of energy, and that is wind energy. Mm -hmm. We see very few wind farms onshore. We see none offshore. There is a project uh, with Estonia with about 100 uh, megawatt capacity, but that's uh, uh, offshore, and that's a bit of a long-term project. Uh, We're lagging behind in terms of installed uh, wind capacity for a number of reasons, for not in my backyard, for difficulty of uh, municipalities to sell the idea to... uh, to the citizens, also, you know, other types of issues. But all in all, at the end of the day, um, uh, Latvia is lagging behind in terms of wind and also in terms of solar. Uh, If in wind it's lagging behind uh, uh, perhaps uh, 10 10, 10 times by a factor of 10, uh, in terms of solar, it's starting to lag behind by a factor of 20. So uh, there's a lot of work to do in, uh, in, in alternative energy. Thank you very much, Martin Zemit is from the European Commission in Latvia. Now, the hardest aspect of tackling climate change issues is the fact that emissions or rising waters do not respect national borders. Understanding and engagement for what is needed is actually a collective challenge. So as we are focused on ports and shipping today, I look forward to hearing what Latvia's Minister of Transport, Thales Linkites, will share. What is Latvia actually doing to achieve climate neutrality goals in the realm of institutional behavior, alternative fuels, or state investments? Honorable Minister Linkaits, Lūdzu. Dear colleagues, um, uh, I'm very glad to participate in today's event and share my thoughts on on the topic of uh, Green Deal and uh, port development. Today's theme is very important, uh, and I'm happy that so many of you are interested in it. The overall goal of the European Union's green uh, course is to make Europe uh, climate neutral by 2050. The current ambition is to reduce greenhouse gas emission by 40% uh, by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. In its 2020 communication on strategy for sustainable and smart mobility, the European Commission has outlined the direction in which the transport sector will move move with a view uh, to climate neutrality in 2050, which will have the most direct impact on the logistics, including ports. Sustainability and digitalization are the key words um, for this common direction. Similarly, a European level priority of shifting a large proportion of road freight to rail and inland waterways remains relevant and has revived in terms of climate goals. In its long-term strategy, the European Commission emphasizes that ports are and will be important for international connectivity for the European economy as a whole while becoming emission-free mobility transport hubs connecting all relevant modes of transport. New technologies, sustainable solutions and innovation are crucial for the implementation of climate goals. And we can already see that Latvian entrepreneurs are working in this direction. Consequently, the current and future multi-annual budget of the European Union will go in the direction of sustainability and innovation, followed by overall financial sector assessing the allocation of funding and its compliance with the green direction. 
In July this year, the European Commission presented a package of proposals to help achieve the 55% reduction target. The proposals in this package are directly relevant to ports and their operation. For example, the alternative fuel infrastructure regulation, which obliges ports to provide shore side electricity to ships. On the other hand, the fuel EU maritime regulation aims to increase the share of marine renewable and low emission fuels and the obligation to use shore-based connections in ports. The maritime sector is also being included in the emission trading scheme and the new maritime tax is planned through the revision of the energy tax directive. These discussions on proposals have begun and uh, will not be easy, but the direction is clear and it is important uh, for the sector to look at how to streamline its operations, services, processes in order to develop and grow in this transformation process. Of course, the logistics sector is global and the players involved operate not only in the European Union, but also in the global market. Therefore, fair competition rules must be taken into account in any new regulation that is developed at European level. Latvia's national energy and climate plan outlines a set of national measures with actions until 2030 and is based on the principle of energy efficiency first and aims to promote the development of a climate neutral economy in a sustainable, competitive, secure and market-based manner. Also, the Latvian transport development guidelines for period up to 2027, which were recently adopted by the government, set out the goal of creating an integrated transport system that ensures smart and sustainable mobility, promotes countries' growth, and development, as well as contributes to the transition to a low carbon economy. These guidelines provide solutions for cost effective climate and environmental measures that contribute to climate neutrality and reduce the negative environmental impact of transport. A quality and competitive infrastructure that contributes to the overall economic growth of the country is undeniably essential. If we focus specifically on ports, practical measures such as the electrification of port berths and the availability of alternative fuels are essential to achieve climate neutrality. The transport plan uh, pr uh, proposed reconstruction of hydrotechnical structures and improving navigation conditions, including deepening port depths by 2027. Other practical measures include obtaining of equipment, a watercraft for environmental protection and marine safety. It is also necessary to build up appropriate infrastructure in ports. In addition, in 20 core network ports, it is necessary to develop road and rail delivery infrastructure. These all are specific, sharply defined measures that need to be implemented to involve ports in reaching targets set by the European Green Deal. Currently, Latvia is drafting its port development strategy. We do it together with stakeholders and companies working in logistics and freight transport sector. And we are open for suggestions and proposals to the port strategy. And I hope today's discussion and uh, uh, presentations uh, will provide valuable input uh, to our uh, port development strategy. Once again, thank you for inviting me and I wish you excellent uh, day of discussion. Mr. Minister, thank you very much for finding the time to join us.
uh, I've had several questions sent in to me to pose, if, uh, so if I may. The very first one is, is uh, actually a continuation of what you ended your intervention with, which is really the um, port strategy or what, what the role, how you see the role of Latvian ports in the implementation of the Green Deal. And you just outlined some of the facets that you seem still to be working on. Do you have any um, notion of where we are compared to Lithuanian, Estonian, or even Nordic ports? How do Latvian ports measure in that whole environment? Uh, I believe that the Latvian ports uh, are in a similar level as, as our neighboring ports, since uh, we all are um, working in the same Baltic ports uh, organization and, uh, and the port community is comparing uh, its uh, strategies and, uh, and uh, tasks uh, similarly, I know that uh, Latvian ports have uh, conducted several conferences and research on, on how uh, jointly uh, tackle issues like, like uh, electrification of uh, the port uh, industry, uh, digitalization of the port services, as well as uh, how to achieve the, the green um, uh, the, the Green Deal uh, goals set by uh, the European Commission. So I would say the Baltic ports are at the same level. There is a lot we can learn from each other. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, there are still a lot to do. And I very much hope that uh, the Latvian port development strategy that we're working on will contribute. to it. Okay. Now, these days we can observe... Lithuania's Transport Minister Marius Skodis actively engaging with Canadian and American ports and logistics providers. Could you perhaps share what the specific planned measures are to increase Latvia's competitiveness in the field of international logistics? Moreover, uh, for example, what would be your expectations and messages to private investors, shipping and energy companies, who are researching and evaluating the possibilities to create transportation branches to Latvia and invest in Latvia in areas related to logistics and energy. So it's strategy, energy, logistics, competitiveness. Yeah, Latvian ports are open to investment and open to cooperation with uh, other international partners. Uh, I would say that uh, during the last uh, several years, we have experienced uh, um, strategic change from the so-called traditional uh, transportation of strategic goods like oil and coal uh, to more uh, value-added uh, uh, activities in the port territories. Uh, for example, uh, Riga Port Authority is working together with the Duisburg uh, uh, port to develop uh, industrial zone uh, uh, next to the current uh, uh, port terminals and uh, is evaluating uh, different options how to attract large-scale investors in this uh, industrial zone. Similarly, also Vanspils and Liepaja ports are looking for value-added products that could substitute the coal and the oil um, shipment. Uh, we as, as a country, we provide and will provide uh, uh, good uh, corporate governance of, of, uh, of the port authorities will provide uh, good investment uh, incentives. Uh, and uh, as example, I would like to mention recent decision of Stenline to increase uh, uh, activities both in Liepaja and in Vanspils uh, with providing larger ships and believing in uh, uh, the logistics and uh, transport uh, services that Latvia provides and will provide for their uh, uh, activities. 
Thank you, Mr. Minister. Later today, we have Stenaline speaking here, actually, that will describe their fleet and their ambition, which should be rather interesting. Two more questions. Uh, and they are more related to reducing our carbon footprint. Do you believe, or I, actually I would say, when will Latvia achieve a carbon neutral transit corridor? I, I think that is a task what we have to um, strive for. Uh, when exactly it will happen, it very much depends on all involved parties uh, in this corridor. Our task from the government side is, is to promote the activities, to, to support financially with investment where it is needed and where, where the governments are allowed to, to do so. But the general direction, especially in, in the transport and logistics sector, is uh, up to the uh, actors of the sector. I believe we will achieve it. But when it happens, we'll see. Okay. Uh, and in that light, the last question. Today, Latvia's major challenge is the ability to manage the COVID pandemic. Are there lessons to be learned, such as the need for a cohesive government strategy and execution on sustainability issues, as opposed, for example, to individual ministry efforts? If the key ministries to ensure Latvia successfully engage in the EU's Green Deal are transport, environment, econ economy, and finance, are you all aligned on sustainable footprint management to be able to address the inherent dilemmas that need resolution for success, much as we find inherent dilemmas or at least seemingly so, in managing the COVID pandemic? Well, you have prepared a very complex uh, question. That's the last one. <laughs> I, yeah, uh, of course, the COVID pandemic uh, has uh, shown us that uh, um, we as a country can overcome uh, serious challenges, unexpected challenges that are we are facing facing already for more than one year and we also see that uh, it the digitalization level of of our public services and our private services helps us uh, uh, working at a distance uh, mm. providing services uh, to our customers our clients uh, in that respect, I, I see that the, the, the um, uh, level of, of digitalization, level of internet connections in Latvia uh, helps us in comparison to maybe some other well-developed countries, for example, Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I have to admit that, that uh, public authorities are not always uh, the, the best ones in uh, working swiftly and smoothly mm -hmm. in addressing uh, the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that also horizontal coordination of different tasks uh, could have been better. Uh, we see these challenges also when we are working on the, our national energy and climate plan, mm -hmm. that there are uh, uh, still uh, a lot work to do together. We have very good cooperation with our uh, Ministry of Environment and Regional Development on, on uh, setting and working on, on specific measures related to tra green transport. But still, what I haven't seen, for example, is green taxation policy. Uh, that is something that we must have, and I hope uh, in coming years, uh, Latvia will deliver it. Thank you. Minister Lenkeitz, thank you very, very much for your time and your uh, responses in depth. Thank you very much. I will now turn to um, the head of the Latvian Investment and Development Agency of Latvia, 
uh, Kaspars Roškalns, who will introduce us all to one of Latvia's key regional programs, Mission C2030. What is this program all about, Mr. Roškalns? Uh, thank you, uh, Your Excellency, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And um, is this the right time that I can share the presentation, right? Yep. Perfect. I'll, I'll try to uh, let's share the screen and see how that goes. And then uh, I'll try to explain how the mission C works. So uh, let me start. That. Um, the main priorities of uh, investments in, in Belgium, Asia, and Latvia currently is uh, three. Uh, so, first of all, to attract high uh, value added investment uh, by fostering innovation and improving uh, overall the Latvian business environment. Uh, to boost uh, export uh, growth, therefore, all uh, that our priority investors are focused uh, on export. And the third task that is uh, last but not least to coordinate a unified state image. And uh, let me explain uh, very briefly how, how that uh, all combines in, in one picture. Uh, the first of all, we have six uh, smart sectors that are priority for investments. It's biomedicine, bioeconomy, smart energy, smart materials, and photonics, ICT or uh, IT and communications, and uh, smart city. Uh, this is the, the key, key focuses uh, where the Latvian future we see in, in investment and, and definitely in the development line. Um, to boost that, those, those sectors, we have uh, in our agency arsenal, let's say so. We have everything starting from the idea, uh, then uh, getting boost in uh, the business innovation and helping to export and helping to attract the, the new markets. Uh, in overall, in, in different government in incentives uh, in the economic transformation and green initiatives the, the, in the digital transformation, Latvia as a whole will, will uh, offer 8 billion euros till 2027. And, uh, and what we have done is to fast track this, uh, this investment that uh, are connected to the smart sector. And this is, uh, this is something that, uh, that we see was missing. And it is the first step ahead that if we prioritize what exactly we need, and I can jump back to this, like we have six sectors, so how exactly the government helps them to be uh, faster to the market. And this is uh, the Green Corridor that uh, is working now from, uh, from April with the uh, uh, five uh, four criteria that you have fill out three of the four. And it means that, uh, that uh, in those uh, specific sectors, uh, that's investment of 5 million euros, creating new jobs, uh, export uh, uh, in, in three years over 3 million euros and uh, investment in R&D over 250K. If you would uh, qualify your investment project qualifies to this, then uh, the service from the government, not only LIA, but from the old government, it uh, includes residence permits, it includes uh, construction permits, uh, it includes the evaluation of uh, environment permits that uh, government have, have to serve you two times faster than, uh, than uh, uh, legislation states currently. And we see we have currently a nine projects in, in the Green Corridor, and uh, they're very happy to be there. Even this is uh, no money. They are just the government are showing that we can move faster than uh, the legislation says. And we don't need 30 days to reply to each, uh, each letter. We can do it uh, double, double the speed if your investment projects are prior priority. So, how to sweeten the deal? Uh, we have incentives for investors for uh, staff training. That's the, that's the problem number one. That all the investors say that hey guys, uh, that the staff is, is, is lacking, and uh, and you have to do something about that. And therefore, the 250k per project is something that that is available for uh, for all the investors that uh, wants to train the, the staff. And therefore, this is in the pipeline. In the future, we have. Uh, uh, this uh, from the uh, restructuring and resilience fund uh, for the uh, economic transformation. Um, it is uh, 82.5 million euros, uh, mostly focusing on uh, how to support uh, with, with different uh, instruments, uh, mostly grants, uh, focusing on uh, digitalization. And uh, this is uh, this is something that we see uh, in the future. That how to push forward 
how to help the companies to innovate, how to help the companies to get to the Horizon Europe, uh, Horizon Europe money. And again, this is going to be a very uh, important instrument to this uh, economic transformation that, that we talk all, all about. Mr. Lushkans, uh, you have yep. four minutes max Perfect. for the C Mission 2030. Yes, I'm very good on my time. So, uh, uh, to finalize the instrument, uh, 80 million uh, euros uh, allocated for uh, industrial parks that will be the places or locations for those six smart sectors where to enter them. And now, when we have the instruments, we have the vision on the sectors. The question is uh, how to align the policy. Their mission C2030 comes in, into the picture. That uh, we see that there was the gold rush, there was the oil rush, and the next one is the water rush. And uh, the mission C, we call it uh, connected to the sea because it's Baltic Sea, but actually it is all about the new economy for clean water everywhere. It is included the digital twin, the smart city solutions, uh, everything, everything that you can connect to the, dig the digital transformation to the Green Deal is uh, kind of part of the sustainable way of living. And uh, therefore, one of the, the key parts is this uh, clean water. We see currently the 1 billion people is lacking access to the clean water. And in 2030, it's going to be 3 billion people. Therefore, we have to have here uh, the solution and uh, where to sandbox. Uh, where to stress test and uh, where to innovate. And this is the, the mission C is actually the place uh, where the legislation would be sandboxed and we would be able to generate innovative ideas uh, to align the uh, government policies of the future, to gather the data, to make the data, uh, data-based government policies and uh, to stress test uh, the solution. From the entrepreneurs, they will be able to align with the value chain, how they would be able to sell the product, the service for the 3 billion people that will lack the water. And, uh, and here we will be able to, to test how the legislation of the future, that everybody talks about the Green Deal, but how to simultaneously implement the Green Deal policies is not very clear. Therefore, this the sandbox approach would be this where we can stress this, where we can uh, add the innovation part and then uh, scale it up to the, to the what, whatever it works, scale it up to the country level. That is the mission C approach in combination how the mission C is the tool, how we'll be able to implement the policies of, uh, of European Green Deal. That is, uh, that is it from my side and I really think that I made it on time. Thank you very much. You did great. Thank you very much. So two questions. If, when I look at your presentation, especially also in the end around the sort of blue part, the blue economy part of your presentation, if there is just one action that needs to be taken, let's say by a company in Latvia to jump into the sandbox, what needs to be done? Yep. First of all, we have to design the sandbox. Therefore, uh, what needs to be done at missionlatvia.com and you have to subscribe. So we will be able to, to mm -hmm. join those companies to the design thinking uh, laboratories, let's say so, where we will design what is actually the need, not only by Latvians, but uh, NBA countries, with, together with the Nordic institutions that we know, like uh, Helicom and Fil uh, Finland, they have a lot of research done how to make the, the blue economy really ready but the problem is it's, it's lacking the place where to try to test those policies in the real life so did i hear correctly that all you have to do is log on to mission clean water latvia mission latvia just com. mission latvia com for the c2030 sandbox app, sandbox application okay second question completely different but you are, at the end of the day, one of the people promoting good business in the region. Uh, now, we know that the pandemic has changed some trading patterns and some expectations. In the business world, especially in the companies where, that I work with, uh, we increasingly hear of a need for Latvian or Baltic nearshoring strategies, which is nearshoring from Asia to the Baltic. 
What do you think? Is there any work underway to actually strategically uh, find benefit for nearshoring for us? On the nearshoring part, uh, we see that is uh, already happening. Uh, the uh, strategy to get more uh, companies interested is that you have to have the product, you have to have the business environment. And again, this, is, this comes back to, to the sandbox, that uh, the problem with the legislation is it's easy, I believe that according to the Investors Council in Latvia, they, they say it's 47, 47 problems that we have to fix. 47 priorities that needs to be changed, so we would be number one. But the problem is, if you have 47, it's very hard to, to fix them all at the same time. Yeah. Therefore, it is impossible. Therefore, the, the, what we have to do is uh, we, we have to uh, gather around with, with the NBA partners uh, to, to figure it out what is the near shorting. Because for, for the Latvian part, we don't want to be really, we don't want to be uh, closer China. What we want to be, we want to be an innovation partner. And, mm. uh, and, and this is the uh, important part. But we, we have to jump uh, like frog, frog leap forward with the, we, we don't want to, to take the factory, let's say, one on one, what was in China and copy paste here in Latvia because we're lacking energy resources, we're lacking human resources, et cetera. What we want is, is here, we want to create the factory of the future that would substitute the, the need. And, uh, and this is, to create those uh, really uh, industry 4.0 uh, manufacturing plants, it takes a lot of resources, it takes a lot of risk, and, and, and there that we see this is uh, that all the instruments are, are heading to this way. Therefore, the, the nearshoring is, is not just we will be closer and cheaper, we will probably be closer, that is true, but we will definitely be what we want to be, we want to be a partner, not that somebody that you only order something, but, but actually somebody who can deliver not only the product, but also the innovation part. Thank you, Mr. Roshkans, the head of the Latvian Invest, uh, Investment and Development uh, Agency. Thank you very much. Uh, and we move to our next um, speaker. Uh, let me note that anybody who wants to pose a question on Slido, please go ahead, hashtag one. Four, 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 five times the four. Uh, we already have two questions while the minister was speaking, and we will try to get a response, a direct response for you, though some of the re replies or uh, uh, answers were implied in what uh, he presented. Now, when I um, was leading the Rail Baltica project, for three years I spoke about the importance of moving the logistics business from road to electric rail um, to significantly reduce our carbon footprint and find excellent sustainable multimodal solutions for cargo. But trade and logistics don't work without excellence in shipping. In the Baltic region, we rarely home in on the shipping business at all. Expect for seeing some of those diesel fume belching ships on the Baltic Sea horizon when suntanning on our sandy shores. So the role of shipping companies in decarbonizing trade is essential if we wish to succeed in being sustainability leaders in the region. We're privileged to have two great shipping companies share their view, Samskip and Stenaline, in two rather exciting presentations. Thus, I'm delighted to first introduce Eric Levenhaupt, Head of Sustainability at Stenaline Group to kick off the topic. Mr. Levenhaupt, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I will try to upload a little presentation here. Voila, I hope you see this. Let me know if uh, there are any technical glitches not so, yet. Um, uh, now we have it. Okay. Not yet. Okay. okay. Now we're okay. No, glit no glitches yet. Yeah. Um, so I was asked to present a little about our company and the role of shipping companies in reducing carbon emissions and specifically in the Baltic. So I wanted to highlight uh, the company I work for, the work we do in sustainability, some of the targets and projects that we have the new ships that was already mentioned by the minister and the environmental features 
and more importantly, what's next. So Stena is a family owned uh, conglomerate. It's uh, based out of Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, there are a number of companies involving wind power, recycling, property, and most importantly, shipping. So Stena Line is one of the companies in the group and our operations is spread across Europe. We connect Europe for a sustainable future, as we say, and we'd like to think of ourselves as an important part of European trade, transport and travel. So uh, our segment is uh, row packs and uh, row rows. And as you can see on the right there is uh, the type of ships that we operate. So it's rolling cargo, mainly lorries, uh, trailers, but also of course, passengers and passenger cars. Uh, we have a significant presence within the Baltic, uh, including the uh, Nynäshamn to Ventspils route. In total, we operate 36 vessels out of 18 routes. We move around 2 million freight units every year. And we like to say that we're on a sustainable journey. Uh, connecting Europe for a sustainable future is not only empty words. We have, since we started, uh, my little department and long before that been working with environmental features and uh, with safety, equality and so on. So the approach we have is quite broad. We're using, uh, we're working with both our onboard assortment, uh, moving out single use plastics, uh, ensuring we have eco label detergents, etc. Uh, but we also use with larger projects, like we did the world's first methanol to dual fuel conversion on a large row packs a couple of years ago. You may have read about Maersk ordering a number of uh, uh, dual fuel methanol container ships. Well, we have one in operation since a few years back. Uh, we're working with the footprint we have on the shore side, and we're working with electrification both with shore power, uh, also with battery hybrids, and with the ultimate ambition of having a fully electric ship, actually two before 2030, operating on the Gothenburg to Fredrikshamn route. How do we structure ourselves within our sustainable work? Well, we have a number of focus areas, and the two most important to us is challenges, not only for Stenaline, but for the industry as a whole. So uh, gender equality and clean energy uh, is our long-term commitments. And we want to work for an industry which is emission-free and characterized by equality and diversity. And we've launched two long-term plans up to 2030 to govern us uh, in that respect. In terms of targets, what we're setting is 30% carbon emissions reduction by 2030. So 30 by 30 and zero emissions or net zero by 2050. And that's with 2019 as baseline. Inequality, 30% is also the magic number, but the timeline is shorter. So our ambition is to have 30% share female leaders, uh, management and board of directors by end of next year. And we recently reached our target of having a first female captain on board one of our ships. Hopefully not the last. Uh, when it comes to Nynäshamn to Ventspils, we're happy to introduce that we're right in the middle of a fleet, fleet renewal process. And this is part of what the offering for a ship owner is, introducing new, larger, hopefully, and uh, definitely more efficient ships. So as you can see between the uh, previous ships, Stena Flavia on the Stena Scandica, which is uh, sailing right now, and in the, at the end, the new e-flexor, which is currently under construction in China. We are increasing the size of the ships and thereby also the emissions per unit. Uh, this is an estimate on the carbon intensity for the new e-flexor uh, compared to the previous versions. Of course, the best we can do for the environment is also to fill the ships up so that we have a uh, per unit, even more efficient route between Latvia and Sweden. 
But the new ships that we're introducing next year is not only bigger, they're also more efficient. The E-Flexer class is a series of five ships for Stena Line, but in total it's uh, so far 12 ships on order, uh, also being uh, sold to other operators and handled by our sister company, Stena Roro. And as you can see, there is a number of uh, smart initiatives on board a ship. Uh, we're using biodegradable lubrication oils, we have an anti-fouling paint using Selectope, which is an organic and copper-free biorepellent. Uh, the ships have shoreside electricity connections installed. So we're hoping to have shoreside electricity also in tent spills going forward. And the engines are uh, diesel electric. So they are prepared for conversions to uh, battery hybrids. And my last slide going forward. So what is next then for Stena Line? How will we continue to lower our carbon footprint? Well, there are a couple of areas of, of focus. And one is in the short term, increasing efficiency and doing that by utilizing all the tools that we have in our toolbox, such as hull coating, propellers, different types of technical installations, wind propulsion, etc. We also work with the crew that we have on board, uh, giving them digital tools to uh, increase their, their uh, possibility to operate each sailing in the most efficient way. Methanol, I mentioned we have one ship. Uh, we're evaluating whether we can upgrade and convert more ships to dual fuel methanol uh, propulsion. And we took one interesting step earlier this year when we did the first trial voyage using blue methanol uh, from a EU research project called Freshme. And that methanol was used by, produced by electrolysis and recycled carbon from steel production. And finally, future is electric. I mentioned shore power. We today have 14 ships equipped with shore power. We have one battery hybrid. Before we launch a fully electric ship, I think we will see more hybrids on the water um, and they can be big or small. The current one we have is one megawatt hour. Uh, we have looked on, on installation as big as 10 megawatt hours as well. Uh, so electrification in the whole transport system and shipping is, is no exception there. So I think that was my 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Mr. Levenhaupt, thank you very much for this presentation. You certainly demonstrated that the devil is in the detail when you're going for uh, very many different kinds of sustainability goals and that Stena Line is certainly uh, well on its way. And as I'm a regular customer on your ferries, I'm just delighted to see that the environment that I'm traveling on is as sustainable as it currently can be. But I was taken with your slide that illustrates that success to attain the sustainability goals for Stena Line are equally balanced between energy and equality. And the seeking equality on every level of the organization slide is essentially a roadmap to diversity in management and teams with an inclusive workplace free of harassment. Now that kind of an ambition would be very unusual for most companies in the Baltic. Why is that so explicitly included in your sustainability strategy? If you look on our, on our uh, business uh, as in maritime, I think uh, there is something like two and a half percent of uh, all seafarers which are female. Um, obviously that's, that's leaving out a large portion of talent and, and knowledge from the, from the workforce. So going forward, uh, I think maritime and shipping can do a lot better by being an attractive workplace for, uh, for females in general, but, but also increasing the, the diversity in, uh, in our companies. We, we really want to strive for being uh, an, an, an employer where you can where you can thrive uh, regardless of, uh, of race and background uh, uh, and nationality, etc. And we think for us, it's important that we can uh, attract talent from the whole workplace mm -hmm. and, and not only parts of it. Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, and I will now turn to the next great uh, Nordic shipping company, Samskip, uh, and introduce Are Groten, the regional director for Samskip in Norway, to present his rather cogent view of how we could address the Green Deal challenge of 2030 and 2050 in the region. Mr. Graten, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I was told that uh, my presentation would be uh, remotely uh, operated by uh, the organizers here, so I hope that's correct. Yes, it is. <laughs> very good. Okay, uh, first of all, impressive uh, presentation by Eric and uh, being a shipping guy myself, it's of course great to see that uh, a company like Stena is, uh, is taking this uh, more than seriously, I would say, and, and really uh, stepping up the game as with many other uh, shipping companies around. Now, um, I have also 10 minutes, so I'll try to keep, uh, keep track of time, uh, but do help me if I'm uh, over sliding here. Um, Somskip is, uh, yes, we are seen as a shipping company, which, uh, which we are, but uh, we are also so much more. Um, Somskip is, in essence, a uh, multimodal uh, transport company uh, with focus on the pan-European continent as, as its trading uh, area. And uh, the core business of Sumskip is really to move unitized cargo um, across the continent uh, in the most sustainable way, using all means of transport. And uh, naturally, on certain uh, routes, uh, a ship is uh, both necessary and a natural way of transporting. But the um, major um, revenue in the company is actually not sea related. So if you could change to the next uh, page. Now, um, I'm not uh, sort of uh, speaking here on, on behalf of, of some skip as such, but I'm, I'm uh, uh, more from an industry uh, point of view and uh, where the transport companies needs to take their share of reaching the overall goal, uh, which for, uh, from an EU point of view, uh, they have called Fit for 55 meaning that EU is committed to reduce emissions by 55% before 2030. So that's nine years from now, and uh, time is uh, running. Um, obviously transport, not only sea transport, but transport industry itself uh, has a big share of the current uh, emissions and need to uh, do stress, uh, take st drastic, uh, uh, measures to um, to help the overall uh, community to reach this goal. Next. So why am I here as uh, representing Samskip in Norway? Um, it's simply because I think within the uh, European countries, uh, Norway is really taking a uh, forefront in, uh, in um, the green shift when it comes to um, emission-free uh, transport, uh, and then with particular focus on marine transport. And um, also uh, when uh, being in Norway, um, it's more or less all about hydrogen as the next fuel uh, to use on, on the sea. But uh, when you go further south in Europe or east in Europe, hydrogen is not mentioned uh, so much as an alternative fuel. And uh, why is hydrogen then so high on the agenda in Norway? It's simply because of uh, Norway's access to clean energy, because making hydrogen is demanding uh, a lot of energy. And uh, Norway uh, has substantial uh, hydro or um, uh, water-based uh, access to, to, to electricity. So that's why I'm uh, representing uh, uh, some skip in this, being a Norwegian. Um, you can go to the next. So uh, evolution, and I think Eric had also a good slide on this. That uh, you know, uh, we we from from a shipping point of view, we need to continue. We are uh, we have been taking too long in the evolution of shipping. Um, 
it's a long time since new technology came into the shipping uh, industry. Um, and uh, time has certainly come for the next step. Uh, a little bit back to Sumskip, what have they done? Uh, time being, we are, we are not as far as Stella Line here, but uh, we have recently acquired uh, uh, LNG propelled ships. But of course, we all know that LNG is uh, still fossil fueled and, uh, and um, is by no means emission free. So we have to take the next step. And you see a ship on the, on the right hand side there, which is um, something that we call a sea shuttle. And uh, that is actually propelled by hydrogen. We are now at the verge of uh, actually placing uh, orders for such ships. And um, we hope to see them floating and in operation before 2025. Next uh, slide. So again, why is Sumskip taking part in this? And as I said, uh, we are not only a shipping company, but we do transport across Europe. Um, it's the network that, that uh, brings us to the forefront of such a project. Um, we want to take a mix of all uh, the different ships we have in the fleet today and convert it to uh, emission-free ships where we can. Obviously, uh, this is not possible everywhere, but uh, certainly, as you can see from the route map on the side here, there are certainly routes where we can put in these shuttles. And unlike Stena, who's uh, thinking big, I saw the ships there, they are uh, fairly big on uh, very specific routes. We are looking more from a network perspective and rather look at smaller ships in shorter routes um, with a high frequency. Um, next one. And as I said, it's not all about ships. It's all about uh, it's, it's uh, moving the container uh, as emission free as possible uh, from one point to the other. Um, a good friend of mine refers to a port as, uh, or, or shipping as, as uh, taking cargo from where it's not coming from to a, a place it's not going to which is correct because the cargo does not originate in the port and it's not destined for the port. So if you only think the sea leg, then you have only done half the job. So uh, Sumskip is already, uh, of course, a major player in uh, moving cargo from pure trucking over to multimodal uh, transportation. And it's only when we have uh, the ships in place on emission-free fuels, we have the trucks in place with emission-free fuels. And the same goes with not only the train, but also the terminal handling in each port. And I, uh, one of the uh, first speakers here, I think it was the minister that mentioned uh, about infrastructure. And of course, here, um, the governments and the, and the public affairs of this world needs to take their share of, of that part. But, um, we can't do all at once, so uh, so uh, we, let's start with the ship, which uh, which you mentioned uh, had uh, is, is contributing greatly to to the emissions. Next, uh, this is just an example. We saw the route map of Stena. Uh, we have seen the existing route map of uh, Sumskip. Uh, we are, as I said, uh, at the verge of placing orders to build ships, and uh, it's actually in. Baltic region and the Scandinavian region, we are thinking to introduce this firstly. Um, uh, again, we are, uh, unlike others who are looking into electric uh, propulsion, we are looking into hydrogen uh, propulsion. And uh, by trading in this area, which is rather what we call short sea, is of course that we believe that we can uh, run on hydrogen uh, in this area simply because it's available in Norway. So uh, the further away you go from Norway, the harder it's gonna get to get hold of clean hydrogen. So this is why we are using uh, this, uh, these trading routes as our first, uh, uh, first examples. Next. So, uh, the heading of the presentation is off the road into the future. And this is something, not something that we will start doing. This is what Sumskip is all about. Uh, and already 
uh, doing every day, every week, to convert uh, transportation from uh, from uh, road haulage onto multimodal uh, ways of uh, transportation. Um, so that we can do while we are building ships, while we are doing R and D, while we are figuring out how to solve the problem, we can already now, and we are doing, uh, starting uh, the journey for less emissions. And uh, this uh, slide here is just giving an example of the CO2 saving we can do already today with existing tonnage and existing technology. And uh, by the time the sea shuttle uh, comes into play or the Stena ferries come into play, uh, this will be zero in the end. Next. So some skips contribution to this time being is that we will we will introduce um, not only an energy efficient and emission uh, zero emission ready ship, um, but we will also look into um, autonomous cargo handling. Uh, and that's back to the sustainability question where uh, we see that a lot of the resources in a port to port transport goes uh, away in handling the cargo on and off the ship. Now for Stena, that's easy because you just drive it on and drive it off. Uh, well, for our sake, we lift it on and we lift it off. Currently that's being done by human hands uh, sitting in a crane. Um, while well, we see that uh, to take it one step further, we will also give that over to robots. More efficient and more sustainable. Next. And um, that's it. Well, Mr. Grotted, that was the most amazing ship, the last one with the two leaves. So we are going <laughs> somehow in the right uh, direction. You have a very interesting presentation, and especially since it highlights hydrogen. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I've lived a fair bit in, in Norway and, and know, you know, what the movement towards a more sustainable and greener society is like in Norway. And clearly you have water everywhere. And even in Latvia, we have a fair bit of water and I have actually a hydro, you know, generated power here as well. Um, these days we even have a couple of hydrogen uh, sell fueled Toyotas running around in the streets of, of Riga. Uh, and I remember testing some of them in Stavanger, for that matter, quite a few years ago. My question actually to you would be, uh, uh, how confident are you in hydrogen as a mature technology? Uh, is it green enough, so to speak, in Norway or for Norwegians? Where are we in the hydrogen you know, cell development uh, story? Uh, well, I mean, as, as a fuel, it's a proven technology. Uh, yeah. It works. Uh, and uh, the, the only thing that is still, uh, what do you say, under R&D is, of course, the safety aspect around yeah. uh, hydrogen, uh, the danger of explosions and, and, and so on. But then again, if you look at all the other fuels we are using uh, in, in uh, our different uh, vehicles nowadays, uh, that is also uh, a danger, and uh, we have come around that uh, over the years. So I think that with uh, with uh, it needs to mature a little bit more on the safety side of things, but not more than we're already talking about self-driving cars. Sure. Uh, and and here we are also just talking about uh, something that needs to mature in people's heads. Hence, why we are also looking at the autonomous cargo handling side because it will require less human beings in the proximity of the ship. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that will also take the risk, uh, the safety risk uh, further, further down. But um, yeah, that's uh, where I think uh, we stand, that uh, we need to work, uh, continue to work closely with the IMOs of this world, uh, maritime authorities mm. uh, and uh, classification societies in order to uh, foolproof the uh, safety aspect around hydrogen. As, as a fuel, it's already a proven concept. I know that in the European Union, uh, at least in the Transport Commission, you also have the different transport corridors as they have been uh, identified. And there's one certainly that focuses on mainly on marine, on the blue 
uh, corridor, mm -hmm. as, as you would call it, and, and therefore I assume that the movement to more sustainable energy sources uh, are well identified there, which we will soon hear from our next speakers. But one of the other mo more important slides I think that you showed were the seamless sort of door-to-door -door cargo uh, services. In yep. this whole, I know that I know this also from the railway business, you know, and, and how difficult it is in heads for people to move uh, into the seamless thinking that it's not just I need to order a car, you know, a railway, a ship, a, a whatever. Um, mm. Where do you think the winners and losers will be in establishing the um, uh, seamless cargo delivery in the future? I mean, it has taken some skip uh, two decades to build what is there today, and uh, okay. I, uh, and and it, and it is a puzzle, and uh, you know, it's a mix of uh, of assets you own and it's a mix of assets you uh, rent or share. So it, it is a complex mm -hmm. thing, but uh, that's our job to make it easy for the end user uh, to be able to order a container from door to door as easy as it is to order a truck. Tusen tack, Ora Grotten. Thank you very much for the time with us, and thank you very much for following clearly the uh, Nordic Baltic Business Forum. Thank, thank, thank you. you as well. Thank now, our final session is uh, dedicated to the role of energy producers in reducing CO2 emissions and introducing alternative renewable energy sources with interventions from two countries that have been working with fossil fuels for a very long time and are now swiftly seeking solutions in renewable energy concepts. We shall start in Finland, where it is my honor to introduce Dr. Temo Sarjovara Nestes, Head of uh, Research and Development, Products and Applications. Dear audience, kindly recognize that Neste, as a global energy provider, has also been one of the top energy companies seeking and deploying renewable energy as quickly as safely possible. And let me remind you that it's still possible to pose a question on Slido. Dr. Sariovara, the floor is yours. Thank you for the, for the introduction and also for the opportunity to join, join the event. So. Going to the topic, we work, or our roots are in transportation energy. And the question is how to decarbonize that. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, next in brief, I think the most important things that I would like to highlight from our company that we are currently the leader in the renewable diesel production and also in the sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, in the world, we are proud that we have been ranked as fourth most sustainable company in the world, and we have been there on that list for more than 12 years, 13 years already, or something like that. And uh, that's pretty remarkable if you consider that we are really traditional oil refining company from, from the previous decades. And also that we are in the middle of quite intensive uh, investment campaign, increasing our capacity for the next years. But maybe that's about Neste in brief, and we go to the next slide, that uh, because we are in the energy sector uh, and uh, transportation is one of the main sources, the biggest sources of the climate emissions, that uh, what we at Neste want to commit to tackle the climate change and also what is there kind of behind that we are able to be there on the top most sustainable uh, sustainable companies in the world, although that we are working with also today with the crude oil. But uh, what, what we are about to do to, to keep the pace or even accelerate the pace. We can see that we can do that for the sustainability and for the climate. Uh, we have given different approaches. One question is, of course, our own carbon footprint. Our portable refinery here in Finland is, by the matter of fact, one of the biggest CO2 emitters in Finland. I think we are number two or three statistically. So we, are, we have huge responsibility here in Finland in that sense. And how to reduce that emission? And we have made a promise to reach carbon neutral production here at Porvo by 2035. And that is really a huge challenge. Huge challenge requires a lot of 
new technology to intro, introduce and a lot of investments also. The pathway, let's say the roadmap is rather clear, but there's still a lot of open questions also that how to reach that. But that, that is something that we are committed and uh, uh, the road, road trip to that goal has already started. Another big topic is the whole value chain, carb, carbon footprint and uh, carbon kind of emission intensity of the sold products. And we are all also working heavily there to reduce uh, the carbon footprint with our of our suppliers and partners to reduce uh, the emissions across our whole value chain. But uh, maybe one of the most important, or maybe the most important reason why we are ranked as fourth most sustainable company is what we have done as our handprint, meaning that how much we have helped our customers to reduce their emissions uh, in the past, today, and for the future, we have made the commitment that with our products, renewable and circular products, our customers could, would be uh, able to reduce at minimum 20 million tons of uh, CO2 equivalent emissions by 2030. And that requires a lot of new production capacity for us. That's not fine tuning the current production. But let's go for, forward the next slide. And specific, like, specifically what it, what it means here in Porvo has mentioned that it's, we are really one of the biggest refineries here in uh, in whole Baltic area. So the emissions, the amount of emissions that we generate is unfortunately rather big. But we are heavily or seriously there to cut them down. And uh, uh, by 2030 already, as a kind of midterm promise, we are committed that we will cut the 50% of the CO2 emissions from Porvo. And as mentioned in the earlier slide, we have also uh, further commitments for, for 2035. And also uh, what it means, for instance, in Porvo for our fossil refinery, that we have committed to have a share of renewable and circular feedstock there uh, replacing fossil crude oil more than 10% by 2030. So meaning that our uh, refinery products will, be, uh, will have less carbon intensity in the future as we replace the fossil crude oil with other feedstocks. And I think then we can go to the next slide. And uh, just kind of example where we are now. Our current spearhead products is our renewable diesel, less than my. Uh, it's sold in 28 countries across the globe. Uh, in some countries with our own brand, uh, with some other countries with our customer's brand. And today we have more than 600 filling stations. You can buy uh, our Neste My product as a neat 100% renewable diesel, uh, 500 of those in EU and 100 in, in US there, mainly on West Coast, California, Oregon, and so on. And uh, more or less, more than 4,000 customers, business to business customers, are using our, our products today. But that is today. What is what in the future? And if we go to the next slide, that uh, we saw that pro current production, there is still possibilities to grow. There is still possibilities to grow the feedstocks, feedstock, feedstock pool, and also production volumes. But that's not let's say enough for the climate. So we need, we see that we have to go uh, from the current fatty acid and uh, next PTL technology that we are using uh, to produce renewable products to further. And what we see there as a next steps, the co-processing as we call it, meaning that uh, as in a previous slide, I mentioned that uh, we are planning to use uh, uh, circular and uh, renewable feedstock in our Porvo fossil refinery. That will happen already during the next few years. After that, the next step will be the chemical recycling. Uh, they will start to use uh, liquefied waste plastic as a refinery feed, as, as again, reducing the, car, uh, the crude oil use at our refinery. 
then we have a, a thing or kind of uh, innovation platforms uh, uh, running up at the moment. And the idea behind those that they are kind of internal uh, startup, startup platforms for the new feedstock pools beyond the current technologies. There we are looking at algae, for instance, lignocellulosic uh, waste streams, municipal solid waste, but also big thing there is renewable hydrogen and power to X. And there is a huge potential for the future. Uh, then we can go to the next, next one. But the question is that, uh, as we hear quite often in the public conversation, that it's electrification, 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 especially in the road transport. Why we believe that there is still need to develop new solutions also for the fuel markets. And here, we, if we start looking that the global crude oil consumption is, is roughly that 4,500 million tons annually. And then we can go to the next slide. Uh, transportation uses roughly 60%, two thirds of that. The rest of goes to the energy, uh, petrochemistry, plastics, and so on. But here, if we focus here on this two thirds, 60% part, that is if, if, if we want to have a clean transportation, we should get rid of all those blue boxes and replace with them with something else. And if we take the next slide, we see that how it's divided on the different segments that we can say that the road transport is by far the biggest there in the middle and the shipping and aviation roughly are uh, equal size and roughly we, we can say maybe one third of the whole transport sector co2 emissions and also the crude oil use and but let's go forward to the next slide and uh how it looks today there is a very small small light bluish uh, half of the box there in the middle of the slide. That represents how much last year we had globally on road electrical vehicles, 10 million roughly, and they replaced roughly 6 million tons of crude oil. And that's how, it's, uh, how big it is when comparing the whole usage of the crude oil transportation. And on the other hand, we see that on the left, left corner, there's a green boxes, which indicates how much we used last year uh, uh, renewable biofuels globally. And we can say that it's remarkably big, but of course it's not that visible because most of that uh, biofuel are sold as a blending components with rather low percentage like E5 gasoline or B7 diesel with some few percent of biofuel blended that not visible to customers. But that's remarkable already by volume. But the question of course is that what is the future? The electrification is going to ramp up uh, quickly, that's for sure. And now we can go to the next slide. But if we took, for instance, IEA's uh, internal energy agency's forecast for 2040, they forecast that there will be 600 million electrical vehicles uh, in 20 years, more or less. And that replaces those, uh, those boxes there on the right side. But on the other side, we see already that if we go to the new feedstock pools like lignos, uh, algae solid, uh, municipal solid waste, for instance, there's remarkable potential on the renewable fuels that can be taken into use. And that is the reason why Neste believes in this business and wants to invest to develop new feedstock pools and new technologies that we are able to use them as a feedstock for fuel products. But what, what is needed here? Smart regulation. And that is the challenge at the moment, that our regulation landscape is rather complex. And generally, it's not always that positive for the renewable fuels. And that might challenge that how big part of the full potential we are able to use uh, in the future. And let's go forward. And that was my presentation in a nutshell. I hope I pretty much kept the schedule. Dr. Sariovara, I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, you, in fact, highlighted probably something that we, one could spend a whole Nordic business forum on uh, specifically, which is the fact that fossil fuels are not going to disappear overnight. 
uh, and, and quite the contrary, we need to be able to look at other solutions to maybe alleviate some parts of fossil fuel usage. But at the end of the day, it is actually about how to reduce emissions and how to make fossil fuels cleaner in very simplistic uh, terms. So thank you very much uh, for today. It was um, uh, uh, wonderful to see what Nesta has achieved uh, over in these years in R&D for cleaner fuels. And then, by no means planned, as I have spent a significant part of my life uh, with and in Norway, I'm tickled pink, actually, to end our Nordic uh, Business Forum interventions with the renowned Norwegian Energy Partners uh, to hear about sharing Norwegian competence with international energy needs. Jürgen Brandt Theodorsen, the floor, the final floor today is yours. Thank you for that. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, um, I'm going to talk about offshore wind um, as a renewable energy source, and I'm going to talk about um, uh, Norwegian uh, capabilities and technology and the potential collaboration between Latvia, the Baltics, and the Norway within energy and specifically offshore wind. I hope you are able to see my screen now. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, Norwegian offshore expertise and how that adds value to the to the to the global offshore wind. Um, so Norway, Norway, where are we coming from? Um, we are coming from uh, from uh, hydrogen. We are coming from oil and gas, of course, that most of you know. Uh, and we have a rich history in 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 terms of uh, energy and and especially renewable energy. And now we are moving also into uh, offshore wind, uh, which I'm going to talk primarily about today. Uh, so we have 50 years of uh, offshore experience uh, gained, uh, gained from, from uh, the exploration on the Norwegian continental shelf, which started up in the late 60s. Um, and we have adopted a lot of this uh, technology and capabilities into industries such as the shipping industry. That's why we have a lot of uh, Norwegian ship owners uh, also working uh, quite globally. Um, so a little bit about the uh, uh, new and 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 uh, and uh, what we do and uh, how we are organized. Uh, so we work with everything within uh, energy or everything covering everything from solar, hydrogen, oil and gas. Uh, offshore wind and, and energy systems, everything that has to do with energy, that, that's, uh, we are involved in that. Um, we have, we have uh, 300 uh, plus member companies uh, which are working within this, uh, uh, which are partner uh, of Norwegian Energy Partners. And uh, our main goal is to increase the Norwegian exports. Um, within these uh, technologies and, and industries. And how do we do that? Um, we, we map, uh, like you see here on the picture here, we, we map the capabilities uh, of, of these companies. And uh, we put them in, this is taken from our uh, website actually, uh, www.novap.com. Uh, so here you can go in and you can click on this, um, these uh, icons. And then you find the capabilities of the Norwegian companies within uh, safety, digitalization, uh, engineering, and, and uh, etc. Uh, we also have a, a, a web page called NorwegianSuppliers.no, uh, which has over 700 uh, technologies and and and, um, and showcasing this supplier's capability. So I encourage you all to, to check that out. But this is a little bit interesting. This is the share of electricity generation by technology in the European Union. I'm borrowing this slide from, from Win Europe. So this is in a sustainable development scenario. So as you can see, offshore wind is increasing directly towards uh, 2000, 
50 in, in terms of, of the share of the electricity supply. And, and uh, as you can see, co together with nuclear coal and, 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 and uh, other power resources, uh, wind is by far the most uh, aggressive one going forward. So who's driving this? Um, who's driving this? Uh, this? Uh, this? Uh, what? What is the drivers behind this? This is driven by governments and institutions, of course. And uh, every day you can read about it in newspapers. You have U.S. now is uh, coming online with a lot of uh, plant capacity. Uh, the Baltics, of course, is coming. Paul has uh, released 5.9 gigawatts of, uh, of offshore wind, and they plan to add another 5 gigawatts of offshore wind. Norway, of course, is coming with uh, 4.5 gigawatt, gigawatts on stream. So uh, capacity is, in, is increasing. The UK is, is aggressive as uh, the, the Germany is coming online. So it's, it's a lot of things happening uh, globally. And this is a little bit interesting. Uh, Amazon uh, just got into a power purchase agreement with Earth Day uh, on a 10 years contract buying 250 megawatts of power from, from Earth Day on their Bochum Riffen Field 3 outside of Germany, uh, which is, I think, is an extremely interesting move uh, made by, by, uh, by such global companies. And we see others are, are going towards this trend as well. So like I recently referred to, the, the capacity is increasing all over the globe. Um, if you go 40 months back, uh, it was 250 gigawatts, which, which were on, online in, in terms of development projects. Now we are talking about uh, close to 550 gigawatts. So it's been adding 250 gigawatts uh, just in 14 months. So the, the, the pace is just uh, incredible in, in this market. And another, a lot of new markets is coming online, emerging markets, not just the one you hear, hear a lot about uh, the UK, the Germany and mature markets, but now you see Brazil is planning on, on, on going, entering this market. Australia is planning to go in, in as well. US is, uh, like I mentioned, is coming on stream with a lot of uh, planned capacity. Um, and, and and China is, is rapidly increasing their capacity, Japan, Vietnam, and, and the list just go on and on. Uh, and we also see this in the, in, in the Baltics as well. Uh, Estonia, are of course, plan, planning together with, with Latvia, uh, capacity increase. Uh, Poland, like I mentioned, Denmark, which were the first ones in this market. They, the first wind farm were up in the early 90s. Um, uh, and, and Sweden has just started the discussion of, of uh, increasing this. So it's a lot of things happening uh, on a global scale. So it's fair to call it a boom. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's, um, that's fair to say uh, with all this capacity coming on stream. Uh, and also hydrogen, which is a hot topic nowadays. And, and how can we kind of implement this uh, with, with wind power? Um, uh, we actually this was in 2004 it, uh, on a small island outside of Norway called Utsira. Uh, had a uh, they started this is this is, has been done for uh, for a long time and Utsira is actually one of the area Norway is going to open up now for offshore wind 1.5 gigawatts is coming on stream and that's going to be floating wind uh, may, uh, just floating wind and this is also a bit interesting this is. Um, Energy Island, which Denmark uh, has has released, Belgium has also uh, released plans for this, and Netherlands has also come on stream with 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 plans. But I think Denmark is in the forefront of this for the moment, uh, and they're talking about being, building this artificial island, uh, 80 kilometers off the coast, and connect with uh, several offshore wind farms. Uh, so this is one artificial island, and they are talking about doing. Uh, the same on Bornholm, uh, having a capacity of two gigawatt. This, the, the one illustrated on the picture, I think it's about three uh, gigawatt output they are thinking about uh, implementing. So this is this is really interesting uh, going forward. Uh, and but of course it it will uh, will huge investments needs to go into this if uh, 
if this is going to be materialized. And this is also a conversation which is uh, a rather hot on the uh, topic during, um, during the time. It's the power to act and interconnection between grid connections and, and, and kind of uh, grid connection between uh, countries and, and borders. And this is also which is a discussion which is coming more and more online and being more and more relevant. So how are we going to achieve the ambitious goal made by the stakeholders and policymakers in reference to developing sustainable renewable sources of energy, such as offshore wind, on a journey to a decarbonized world? Jürgen, I, I think, hate to tell you, you only have two minutes left. Yeah, yeah, we'll be fast. So okay. competition and innovation will drive down the cost. As you can see on the picture here, this is um, uh, offshore support vessel. They are talking about doing this more and more anatomously. So the picture. The smaller vessel on the left-hand side of the, on the picture is, is remotely controlled. And this is solutions are coming more and more into in, in, on stream. And Norway use a lot of digitalization uh, on the Johan Kastrup field, uh, which produced 650,000 barrels a day. Most of the platforms are remotely operated from land. And this we will try to implement in the offshore wind as well. On the installation side, uh, there is a lot of uh, Norwegian capabilities and a lot of known uh, owners. On the foundation side, uh, Norway uh, has installed Hyvin, which uh, probably some of you have heard about. And now we're in the process of installing Hyvin Tompan to, to decarbonize the, the oil, and, oil and gas uh, platforms. Um, so there's a lot of things uh, happening on the foundation side as well, and a lot of technology coming out of uh, Norway. Also on the substation, that's also on the substation side. Uh, the substation on Dogger Bank are going to be delivered by AWO. Um, on the safety side, Norwegia has a rich history uh, coming from the oil and gas side and, and being uh, working 50 years in the maritime environment uh, uh, to, uh, to, to help the, the producing assets in the North Sea. Uh, same on the uh, OMV operations. There's a lot of things um, happening there. This also links to, to the digitalization part. And, and also uh, companies such as sub 7 can do everything from insulation to removal. So the, the full scope from full lifetime cycle of the, of the wind farm. And this is only a short journey from, from Norway. So if you look at the capacity coming online, uh, North Sea is in Europe is uh, by far the most with 80, 80 gigawatts. But the, on the, the, the secondary is Baltic Sea with 52 gigawatts in development phase. So this is, this is really interesting in, in terms of, of uh, numbers and a potential collaboration between uh, Norway and, 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 and the rest of the Baltic region and, and Latvia in particular as well. So just to, to summarize and to, to end my presentation, uh, we're going to have a, a, a International Energy Forum Day uh, in beginning of November, where we go, we'll go through all the uh, energy uh, questions within offshore wind, hydrogen, oil and gas, CCS, uh, uh, et cetera. So I, I, I hope I can see some of you in real person in 3D at that uh, advance. And if you want to know more, uh, please visit our website on uh, novap.com uh, and particularly on, on the wind side. So thank you for that. Jürgen, thank you very much. I will add uh, two things. Number one, uh, there was supposed to be possibly a video shown uh, here from the Norwegian Energy Partners. I assume it may be on your website. And it's yeah. a fabulous video about uh, that sort of b summarizes every things in a very sexy manner, I would say, for, that you were presenting to us. The yeah. second thing is that from all the way today, there's one thing that I envy all of the Nordic countries regularly for. And that is that you are all highly competitive with each other in terms of countries and even companies, but you are able to master collaboration and strong collaboration anyways as companies, as suppliers, as different kinds of concept developers uh, in an excellent way. And we've seen that even just in the last two interventions sort of from Finland to uh, Norway. But when I saw the list of countries you operate in, I was a wee bit disappointed that neither Lithuania, Latvia, nor Estonia were to be found in your lists. How can that be changed? Uh, I, it, it has to be with uh, 
uh, with uh, the capacity. And right now, uh, mm-hmm. I think pool uh, is uh, is a little bit uh, further ahead when it comes to the planning of offshore wind. They have already uh, 5.9 gigawatts on stream. So, uh, but okay. of course, uh, we will increase our capacity uh, once the once the offshore development uh, will and other energy resources will 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 take up. But of course, I wish to have people in every country and they will cover in everything. But we we need to prioritize uh, as well and coordinate our resources. But uh, the the reason why I'm sitting here talking today is because we think that these country that you you all of the countries mentioned and also the rest of the Baltic with uh, with Finland and Sweden and and also taking the energy islands coming into play. I think it's a really interesting uh, market to follow in the in the future as well. And, and um, also, if you look into the energy mix of, of the different countries, it, uh, maybe Norway has uh, value to add in, in terms of uh, uh, renewable energy sources. Tusen tack, Jörgen. And uh, thank you very much for sharing all of this with all of us. So here with our second forum dedicated to the EU Green Deal and Nordic Baltic partnership comes to an end. In our first presentation, we saw Ursula von der Leyen's clear position that the European Green Deal is Europe's new growth strategy while developing in parallel the blue economy. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that the Nordic countries are certainly speeding ahead in the blue economy, in addition to seeking and finding new energy solutions. We've shared an inspiring two hours by brushing the surface of key components needed to reduce our CO2 footprint really fast. On a personal level, I'm not convinced yet that the relevant authorities in Latvia truly comprehend in a collaborative way what it takes to not only gain access to EU Green Deal monies, but deliver on needed commitments. I trust that this Nordic Business Forum will have brought the key players together to forge closer professional collaboration to be fit for 55. And in closing, a very special thank you, Milzik Spaldias, to all the technical people and organizing team in the background who made sure I look good and we were well connected today. Keep safe and goodbye.